The Idris Shah Foundation presents The Sufis by Idris Shah. First published 1964. Published in this edition, 2015. Narrated by David Alt. The Situation Humanity is asleep, concerned only with what is useless, living in a wrong world. Believing that one can excel this is only habit and usage, not religion. This religion is inept. Do not prattle before the people of the path. Rather consume yourself. You have an inverted knowledge and religion if you are upside down in relation to reality. Man is wrapping his net around himself. A lion, the man of the way, bursts his cage asunder. The Sufi master Sinai of Afghanistan, teacher of Rumi, in the walled garden of truth, written in 1131 AD. Preface The last thing that is intended in the writing of this book is that it should be considered inimical to scholasticism or to the academic method. Scholars of the East and the West have heroically consecrated their whole working lives to making available, by means of their own disciplines, Sufi literary and philosophical material to the world at large. In many cases, they have faithfully recorded the Sufis' own reiteration that the way of the Sufis cannot be understood by means of the intellect or by ordinary book learning. That this fundamental has not prevented them from trying to bring Sufism within the compass of their own understanding is a tribute to their intellectual honesty and their faith in their own system of examination. It would, however, be false to Sufism not to affirm that it cannot be appreciated beyond a certain point except within the real teaching situation, which requires the physical presence of a Sufi teacher. For the Sufi, it is no accident that the secret doctrine, whose existence has for uncounted time been suspected and sought, proves so elusive to the seeker. If, say, communism is a religion without a god, academic study of Sufism without being to any extent a working Sufi is Sufism without its essential factor. If this assertion militates against the rational tradition that an individual can find truth merely through the exercise of the faculties with which he finds himself endowed, there is only one answer. Sufism the secret tradition, is not available on the basis of assumptions which belong to another world, the world of intellect. If it is felt that truth about extra-physical fact must be sought only through a certain way of thinking, the rational and scientific one, there can be no contact between the Sufi and the supposedly objective seeker. Sufi literature and preparatory teaching is designed to help bridge the gap between these two worlds of thought. Were it not possible to provide any bridge at all, this book would be worthless and should not have been attempted. Sufism, considered as a nutrient for society, is not intended to subsist within society in an unaltered form. That is to say, the Sufis do not erect systems as one would build an edifice for succeeding generations to examine and learn from. Sufism is transmitted by means of the human exemplar, the teacher. Because he is an unfamiliar figure to the world at large, or because he has imitators, does not mean that he does not exist. We find traces of Sufism in derelict organizations from which this element of human transmission of Baraka has ceased, where the form alone remains. Since it is this outer shell which is the most easily perceptible to the ordinary man, we have to use it to point to something deeper. Unlike him, we cannot say that such and such a ritual, such and such a book, incarnates Sufism. We start with human, social, literary material that is both incomplete 
because now unaccompanied by the impact of the living exemplar, the teacher, and secondary, in that it is only partially absorbed. Historical facts, such as religious and social organization, when they persist, are secondary, external phenomena which depend upon organization, emotion and outward show for their survival. These factors, so essential for the continuation of familiar systems, are, sophistically speaking, only the substitute for the vitality of organism, as distinct from appearance and sentiment. Since Sufism is based upon the realization of truth by the Sufis, its outlook cannot change, though its superficial projection may appear to change. Teaching methods differ in accordance with cultural conditions. In other systems, it is the outlook of the philosophical school which undergoes variation. This has a great significance in attesting to the ancient roots of the Sufi way. It indicates that whereas in the history of progress the outlook of the philosophical doctrines has changed according to environments, the Sufi ideals have remained patent to the original form in adhering to the conception of a comprehensiveness without a frontier. The Sirdar Iqbal Ali Shah, Islamic Sufism, London, 1933, page 10. Accustomed to looking at philosophy as a makeshift, a groping toward truth, changing in accordance with the acquisition of mere information, there are few people nowadays who can even grasp the assertion that there is an ultimate truth against which everything can be measured, and which is accessible to man. A Sufi school comes into being, like any other natural factor, in order to flourish and disappear, not to leave traces in mechanical ritual or anthropologically interesting survivals. The function of a nutrient is to become transmuted, not to leave unaltered traces. The great Sufi teacher Jami refers to this tendency when he says that if the beard is allowed to grow too bushy, it will vie with the hair of the head in its claims for attention or prominence. It will be easily understood that both the organic and human exemplar claims of Sufism remove it immediately from the purview of conventional study. There is, however, some value in paying attention to Sufi influences upon human culture. In the first place, we can observe attempts to bridge the gap between ordinary thinking and Sufi experience, contained in poetic, literary and other media, which have been designed to lead the ordinary, attenuated or embryonic human consciousness into a greater perception and realization. Secondly, it is maintained by Sufis that even in cultures where authoritarian and mechanical thinking have choked comprehensive understanding, human individuality will have to assert itself somewhere, even if this be only through the primitive sense that life must have more meaning than the officially propagated one. In this book, emphasis has been placed upon the diffusion of Sufic thought during a certain phase, from the 7th century of the current era, for illustrative purposes. If, in the process, Material which is completely new has been presented. This is not done for any purpose of scholastic effort. Scholasticism is interested in accumulating information and making deductions from it. Sufism is engaged upon developing a line of communication with ultimate knowledge, not with combining individual facts, however historically exciting, or theorizing in any way at all. Sufism, it should be remembered, is Eastern thought only insofar as it retains beliefs, such as the human exemplar, which have fallen into abeyance in the West. It is occult and mystical inasmuch as it follows a path other than that which has been represented as the true one by authoritarian and dogmatic organization. Sufism claims that the latter attitude constitutes only a part, only a phase in the human story. Claiming a real source of knowledge, Sufism cannot accept the pretensions of the temporary phase which, viewed from within itself, 
is currently considered to be the logical one. A great deal of the material presented here is incomplete because it is not possible to increase the amount of formal literature about Sufism without the balance of Sufic practice. Much of it, nevertheless, is unknown outside traditional Sufi circles. It is not intended to influence traditional scholasticism, with which it has only the most superficial connection, and one which cannot be carried far without distortion. Sufism is known by means of itself. It is interesting to note the difference between science as we know it today and as it was seen by one of its pioneers. Roger Bacon, considered to be the wonder of the Middle Ages and one of humanity's greatest thinkers, was the pioneer of the method of knowledge gained through experience. This Franciscan monk learned from the Sufis of the Illuminist school that there is a difference between the collection of information and the knowing of things through actual experiment. In his Opus Maius, in which he quotes Sufi authority, he says, There are two modes of knowledge, through argument and experience. Argument brings conclusions and compels us to concede them, but it does not cause certainty nor remove doubts in order that the mind may remain at rest in truth, unless this is provided by experience. This Sufi doctrine is known in the West as the scientific method of inductive proceeding, and subsequent Western science is largely based upon it. Modern science, however, instead of accepting the idea that experience was necessary in all branches of human thought, took the word in its sense of experiment, in which the experimenter remained as far as possible outside the experience. From the Sufi point of view, therefore, Bacon, when he wrote these words in 1268, both launched modern science and also transmitted only a portion of the wisdom upon which it could have been based. Scientific thinking has worked continuously and heroically with this partial tradition ever since. In spite of its roots in the work of the Sufis, the impairment of the tradition has prevented the scientific researcher from approaching knowledge by means of itself, by experience, not merely experiment. <laughs>